Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1896-1901, by Lucy Maud Montgomery. A Stray at Allegiance Will you go to the cove with me this afternoon? It was Marion Leslie who asked the question. Esterbrook Elliot unpinned with a masterful touch the delicate cluster of noisette rosebuds she wore at her throat, and transferred them to his buttonhole as he answered courteously, Certainly. My time, as you know, is entirely at your disposal. They were standing in the garden under the creamy bloom of drooping acacia trees. One long plume of blossoms touched lightly the soft, golden-brown coils of the girl's hair, and cast a wavering shadow over the beautiful flower-like face beneath it. Esterbrook Elliot, standing before her, thought proudly that he had never seen a woman who might compare with her. In every detail she satisfied his critical, fastidious taste. There was not a discordant touch about her. Esterbrook Elliot had always loved Marion Leslie, or thought he had. They had grown up together from childhood. He was an only son and she an only daughter. It had always been an understood thing between the two families that the boy and girl should marry, but Marion's father had decreed that no positive pledge should pass between them until Marion was twenty-one. Esterbrook accepted this mapped-out destiny and selected Bride, with the conviction that he was an exceptionally lucky fellow. Out of all the women in the world, Marion was the very one whom he would have chosen as mistress of his fine old home. She had been his boyhood's ideal. He believed that he loved her, sincerely, but he was not too much in love to be blind to the worldly advantages of this marriage with his cousin. His father had died two years previously, leaving him wealthy and independent. Marion had lost her mother in childhood. Her father died when she was eighteen. Since then, she had lived alone with her aunt. Her life was quiet and lonely. Esterbrook's companionship was all that brightened it, but it was enough. Marion lavished on him all the rich womanly love of her heart. On her twenty-first birthday they were formally betrothed. They were to be married in the following autumn. No shadow had drifted across the heaven of her happiness. She believed herself secure in her lover's unfaltering devotion. True, at times she thought his manner lacked a lover's passionate ardor. He was always attentive and courteous. She had only to utter a wish to find it had been anticipated. He spent every spare minute at her side. Yet sometimes she half wished he would betray more lover-like impatience and intensity. Were all lovers as calm and undemonstrative? She reproached herself for this incipient disloyalty as often as it vexingly intruded its unwelcome presence across her inner consciousness. Surely Esterbrook was fond and devoted enough to satisfy the most exciting demands of affection. Marion herself was somewhat undemonstrative and reserved. Passing acquaintances called her cold and proud. Only the privileged few knew the rich depths of the womanly tenderness in her nature. Esterbrook thought that he fully appreciated her. As he had walked homeward the night of their betrothal, he had reviewed with unconscious criticism his mental catalogue of Marion's graces and good qualities, admitting, with supreme satisfaction, that there was not one thing about her that he could wish changed. This afternoon, under the acacias, they had been planning about their wedding. There was no one to consult but themselves. They were to be married early in September and then go abroad. Esterbrook mapped out the details of their bridal tour with careful thoughtfulness. They would visit all the old world places that Marion wished to see. Afterwards, they would come back home. He discussed certain changes he wished to make in the old Elliot mansion to fit it for a young and beautiful mistress. He did most of the planning. Marion was content to listen in happy silence. Afterwards, she had proposed this walk to the cove. "'What particular object of charity have you found at the cove now?' asked Esterbrook with lazy interest as they walked along. "'Mrs. Barrett's little Bessie is very ill with fever,' answered Marian. Then, catching his anxious look, she hastened to add, "'It is nothing infectious. Some kind of a slow, sapping variety. There is no danger, Esterbrook.' "'I was not afraid for myself,' he replied quietly. "'My alarm was for you. You are too precious to me, Marian, for me to permit you to risk health and life if it were dangerous.' What a lady bountiful you are to those people at the cove. When we are married, you must take me in hand and teach me your creed of charity. I'm afraid I have lived a rather selfish life. You will change all that, dear. You will make a good man of me. You are that now, Esterbrook, she said softly. If you were not, I could not love you. It is a negative sort of goodness, I fear. I have never been tried or tempted severely. Perhaps I should fail under the test. 
I am sure you would not, answered Marian proudly. Esterbrook laughed. Her faith in him was pleasant. He had no thought but that he would prove worthy of it. The cove, so called, was a little fishing hamlet situated on the low, sandy shore of a small bay. The houses clustered in one spot seemed like nothing so much as larger shells washed up by the sea, so gray and bleached were they from long exposure to sea winds and spray. Dozens of ragged children were playing about them, mingled with several disreputable yellow curs that yapped noisily at the strangers. Down on the sandy strip of beach below the houses, groups of men were lounging about. The mackerel season had not yet set in. The spring herring, netting, was past. It was holiday time among the sea folks. They were enjoying it to the full, a happy, ragged colony, careless of what the morrows might bring forth. Out beyond, the boats were at anchor, floating as gracefully on the twinkling water as seabirds, their tall masts bowing landward on the swell. A lazy, dreamful calm had fallen over the distant seas. The horizon blues were pale and dim. Faint purple hazes blurred the outlines of far-off headlands and cliffs. The yellow sand sparkled in the sunshine as if powdered with jewels. A murmurous babble of life buzzed about the hamlet, pierced through by the shrill undertones of the wrangling children, most of whom had paused in their play to scan the visitors with covert curiosity. Marion led the way to a house apart from the others at the very edge of the shelving rock. The doorway was scrupulously clean and unlittered. The little footpath through it was neatly bordered by the white clam shells. Several thrifty geraniums in bloom looked out from the muslin-curtained windows. "'Bessie's much the same, Miss Leslie,' she said in answer to Marion's inquiry. "'The doctor you sent was here today and did all he could for her. He seemed quite hopeful. She don't complain or nothing, just lies there and moans. Sometimes she gets restless. It's very kind of you to come so often, Miss Leslie. Here, Magdalen. Will you put this basket the ladies brought up there on the shelf? A girl who had been sitting unnoticed with her back to the visitors at the head of the child's cot in one corner of the room stood up and slowly turned around. Marion and Esterbrook Elliot both started with involuntary surprise. Esterbrook caught his breath like a man suddenly awakened from sleep. In the name of all that was wonderful, who or what could this girl be, so little in harmony with her surroundings? Standing in the crepuscular light of the corner, her marvelous beauty shone out with the vivid richness of some rare painting. She was tall, and the magnificent proportions of her figure were enhanced rather than marred by the severely plain dress of dark print that she wore. The heavy masses of her hair, a shining auburn dashed with golden foam, were coiled in a rich, glossy knot at the back of the classically modeled head and rippled back from a low brow whose waxen fairness even the breezes of the ocean had spared. The girl's face was a full, perfect oval, with features of faultless regularity, and the large, full eyes were of tawny hazel, darkened into inscrutable gloom in the dimness of the corner. Not even Marian Leslie's face was more delicately tinted, but not a trace of color appeared in the smooth, marble-like cheeks, yet the waxen pallor bore no trace of disease or weakness, and the large, curving mouth was of an intense crimson. She stood quite motionless. There was no trace of embarrassment or self-consciousness in her pose. When Miss Barrett said, This is my niece, Magdalene Crawford, she merely inclined her head in grave, silent acknowledgment. As she moved forward to take Marion's basket, she seemed oddly out of place in the low, crowded room. Her presence seemed to throw a strange restraint over the group. Marion rose and went over to the cot, laying her slender hand on the hot forehead of the little sufferer. The child opened its brown eyes questioningly. "'How are you today, Bessie?' "'Madeline. I want Madeline,' moaned the little plaintive voice. Magdalene came over and stood beside Mary and Leslie. "'She wants me,' she said in a low, thrilling voice, free from all harsh accent or intonation. "'I am the only one she seems to know always.' "'Yes, darling. Madeline is here, right beside you. She will not leave you.' She knelt by the little cot and passed her arm under the child's neck, drawing the curly head close to her throat with a tender, soothing motion. Esterbrook Elliot watched the two women intently, the one standing by the cot arrayed in simple yet costly apparel with her beautiful high-bred face, and the other, kneeling on the bare, sanded floor in her print dress, with her splendid head bent low over the child, and the long fringe of burnished lashes sweeping the cold pallor of the oval cheek. From the moment that Magdalene Crawford's haunting eyes had looked straight into his, for one fleeting second, an unnameable thrill of pain and pleasure stirred his heart. 
a thrill so strong and sudden and passionate that his face paled with emotion. The room seemed to swim before his eyes, in a mist out of which gleamed that wonderful face, with its mesmeric, darkly radiant eyes, burning their way into deeps and abysses of his soul hitherto unknown to him. When the mist cleared away and his head grew steadier, he wondered at himself. Yet he trembled in every limb, and the only clear idea that struggled out of his confused thoughts was an overmastering desire to take that cold face between his hands and kiss it until its passionless marble glowed into warm and throbbing life. "'Who is that girl?' he said abruptly, when they left the cottage. "'She is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen.' "'Present company always accepted,' he concluded with a depreciatory laugh. The delicate bloom on Marian's face deepened slightly. "'You had much better have omitted that last sentence,' she said quietly. It was so palpably an afterthought. "'Yes, she is wonderfully lovely. A strange beauty, I fancied. There seems something odd and uncanny about it to me. She must be Mrs. Barrett's niece. I remember that when I was down here about a month ago Mrs. Barrett told me she expected a niece of hers to live with her. For a time, at least. Her parents were both dead— the father having died recently. Mrs. Barrett seemed troubled about her. She said that the girl had been well brought up and used to better things than the cove could give her, and she feared that she would be very discontented and unhappy. I had forgotten all about it until I saw the girl today. She certainly seems to be a very superior person. She will find the cove very lonely, I am sure. It is not probable she will stay there long. I must see what I can do for her. But her manner seemed rather repellent, don't you think? Hardly, responded Esterbrook curtly. She seemed surprisingly dignified and self-possessed, I fancied, for a girl in her position. A princess could not have looked and bowed more royally. There was not a shadow of embarrassment in her manner, in spite of the incongruity of her surroundings. You had much better leave her alone, Marian. In all probability she would resent any condescension on your part. What wonderful deep lovely eyes she has! Again the sensitive color flushed Marian's cheek as his voice lapsed unconsciously into a dreamy retrospective tone, and a slight restraint came over her manner which did not depart. Esterbrook went away at sunset. Marian asked him to remain for the evening, but he pleaded some excuse. "'I shall come tomorrow afternoon,' he said, as he stooped to drop a careless goodbye kiss on her face. Marian watched him wistfully as he rode away, with an unaccountable pain in her heart. She felt more acutely than ever that there were depths in her lover's nature that she was powerless to stir into responsive life. Had any other that power? She thought of the girl at the cove with her deep eyes and wonderful face. A chill of premonitory fear seized upon her. "'I feel exactly as if Esterbrook had gone away from me forever,' she said slowly to herself, stooping to brush her cheek against a dew-cold, milk-white quiche bloom and would never come back to me again. If that could happen, I wonder what there would be left to live for. Esterbrook Elliot meant, or honestly thought he meant, to go home when he left Marion. Nevertheless, when he reached the road branching off to the cove, he turned his horse down it with a flush on his dark cheek. He realized that the motive of the action was disloyal to Marion, and he felt ashamed of his weakness. But the desire to see Magdalen Crawford once more, and to look into the depths of her eyes, was stronger than all else, and overpowered every throb of duty and resistance. He saw nothing of her when he reached the cove. He could think of no excuse for calling at the Barrett cottage, so he rode slowly past the hamlet and along the shore. The sun, red as a smoldering ember, was half buried in the silken violet rim of the sea. The west was a vast lake of saffron and rose and ethereal green through which floated the curved shallop of a thin new moon, slowly deepening from lusterless white through gleaming silver into burnished gold, and attended by one solitary pearl-white star. The vast concave of sky above was of violet, infinite and flawless. Far out, dusky amethystine islets clustered like gems on the shining breast of the bay. The little pools of water along the low shores glowed like mirrors of polished jacinth, the small, pine-fringed headlands ran out into the water, cutting its lustrous blue expanse like purple wedges. As Esterbrook turned one of them, he saw Magdalene standing out on the point of the next, a short distance away, 
Her back was towards him, and her splendid figure was outlined darkly against the vivid sky. Estherbrook sprang from his horse and left the animal standing by itself while he walked swiftly out to her. His heart throbbed suffocatingly. He was conscious of no direct purpose save merely to see her. She turned when he reached her with a slight start of surprise. His footsteps had made no sound on the tide-rippled sand. For a few moments they faced each other so, eyes burning into eyes with mute soul-probing and questioning. The sun had disappeared, leaving a stain of fiery red to mark his grave. The weird, radiant light was startlingly vivid and clear. Little crisp puffs and flakes of foam scurried over the point like elfin things. The fresh wind blowing up the bay tossed the lustrous rings of hair about Magdalene's pale face. All the routed shadows of the hour had found refuge in her eyes. Not a trace of color appeared in her face under Esterbrook Elliot's burning gaze. But when he said Magdalene, a single hot scorch of crimson flamed up into her cheeks protestingly. She lifted her hand with a splendid gesture, but no word passed her lips. Magdalene, have you nothing to say to me? he asked, coming closer to her with an imploring passion in his face, never seen by Marion Leslie's eyes. He reached out his hand, but she stepped back from his touch. What should I have to say to you? Say that you were glad to see me. I am not glad to see you. You have no right to come here. But I knew you would come. You knew it? How? Your eyes told me so today. I am not blind. I can see further than those dull fisher folks. Yes, I knew you would come. That is why I came here tonight, so that you would find me alone and I could tell you that you were not to come again. Why must you tell me that, Magdalene? Because I have told you. You have no right to come. But if I will not obey you, if I will come in defiance of your prohibition— she turned her steady, luminous eyes on his pale, set face. "'You would stamp yourself as a madman, then,' she said coldly. "'I know that you are Miss Leslie's promised husband. Therefore you are either false to her or insulting to me. In either case, the companionship of Madeline Crawford is not what you must seek. Go!' She turned away from him with an imperious gesture of dismissal. Esterbrook Elliot stepped forward and caught one firm white wrist. I shall not obey you, he said in a low, intense tone. His fine eyes burned into hers. You may send me away, but I will come back again and yet again until you have learned to welcome me. Why should you meet me like an enemy? Why can we not be friends? The girl faced him once more. Because, she said proudly, I am not your equal. There can be no friendship between us. There ought not to be. Magdalene Crawford, the fisherman's niece, is no companion for you. You will be foolish as well as disloyal if you ever try to see me again. Go back to the beautiful high-bred woman you love and forget me. Perhaps you think I'm talking strangely. Perhaps you think me bold and unwomanly to speak so plainly to you a stranger. But there are some circumstances in life when plain speaking is best. I do not want to see you again. Now go back to your own world." Esterbrook Elliot slowly turned from her and walked in silence back to the shore. In the shadows of the point he stopped to look back at her, standing out like some inspired prophetess against the fiery background of the sunset sky and silver-blue water. The sky overhead was thick sown with stars. The night breeze was blowing up from its lair in distant, echoing sea caves. On his right, the lights of the cove twinkled out through the dusk. I feel like a coward and a traitor, he said slowly. Good God, what is this madness that has come over me? Is this my boasted strength of manhood? A moment later the hoof-beats of his horse died away up the shore. Magdalene Crawford lingered on the point until the last dull red faded out into the violet gloom of the June sea dusk, than which nothing can be rarer or diviner, and listened to the moan and murmur of the sea far out over the bay with sorrowful eyes and sternly set lips. The next day, when the afternoon sun hung hot and heavy over the water, Esterbrook Elliot came again to the cove. He found it deserted. A rumor of mackerel had come, and every boat had sailed out in the rose-red dawn to the fishing grounds. But down on the strip of sparkling yellow sand he saw Magdalene Crawford standing, her hand on the rope that fastened a small white dory to the fragment of a half-embedded wreck. She was watching a huddle of gulls clustered on the tip of a narrow, sandy spit running out to the left. 
She turned at the sound of his hurried footfall behind her. Her face paled slightly, and into the depths of her eyes leapt a passionate, mesmeric glow that faded as quickly as it came. You see, I have come back in spite of your command, Magdalen. I do see it, she answered in a gravely treble voice. You are a madman who refuses to be warned. Where are you going, Magdalen? She had loosened the rope from the wreck. I am going to row over to Chapel Point for salt. They think the boats will come in tonight loaded with mackerel. Look at them, away out there by the score, and salt will be needed. Can you row so far alone? Easily. I learned to row long ago, for a pastime then. Since coming here I find it of great service to me. She stepped lightly into the tiny shallop and picked up an oar. The brilliant sunshine streamed about her, burnishing the rich tints of her hair into ruddy gold. She balanced herself to the swaying of the dory with the grace of a seabird. The man looking at her felt his brain reel. Goodbye, Mr. Elliot. For answer, he sprang into the dory, and snatching an oar, pushed against the old wreck with such energy that the dory shot out from the shore like a foam bell. His sudden spring had set it rocking violently. Magdalene almost lost her footing and caught blindly at his arm. As her fingers closed on his wrist, a thrill as of fire shot through his every vein. Why have you done this, Mr. Elliot? You must go back. But I will not, he said masterfully, looking straight into her eyes with an imperiousness that sat well upon him. I am going to row you over to Chapel Point. I have the oars. I will be master this once at least. For an instant her eyes flashed defiant protest, then drooped before his. A sudden hot blush crimsoned her pale face. His will had mastered hers. The girl trembled from head to foot, and the proud, sensitive mouth quivered. Into the face of the man watching her breathlessly flashed a triumphant, passionate joy. He put out his hand and gently pushed her down into the seat. Sitting opposite, he took up the oars and pulled out over the sheet of sparkling blue water through which at first the bottom of white sand glimmered wavily, but afterwards deepened to translucent, dim depths of greenness. His heart throbbed tumultuously. Once the thought of Marion drifted across his mind like a chill breath of wind, but it was forgotten when his eyes met Magdalene's. "'Tell me about yourself, Magdalene,' he said at last, breaking the tremulous, charmed, sparkling silence. "'There is nothing to tell,' she answered with characteristic straightforwardness. My life has become a very uneventful one. I have never been rich or very well educated, but it used to be different from now. I had some chance before, before father died. You must have found it very lonely and strange when you came here first. Yes. At first I thought I should die, but I do not mind it now. I have made friends with the sea. It has taught me a great deal. There is a kind of inspiration in the sea, when one listens to its never-ceasing murmur afar out there, always sounding at midnight and midday, one's soul goes out to meet eternity. Sometimes it gives me so much pleasure that it's almost pain. She stopped abruptly. I don't know why I am talking to you like this. You are a strange girl, Magdalene. Have you no other companion than the sea? No. Why should I wish to have? I shall not be here long. Elliot's face contracted with a spasm of pain. You are not going away, Magdalene. Yes, in the fall. I have my own living to earn, you know. I am very poor. Uncle and aunt are very kind, but I cannot consent to burden them any longer than I can help. A sigh that was almost a moan broke from Esterbrook Elliot's lips. You must not go away, Magdalene. You must stay here with me. You forget yourself, she said proudly. How dare you speak to me so! Have you forgotten Miss Leslie, or are you a traitor to us both? Esterbrook made no answer. He bowed his pale, miserable face before her, self-condemned. The breast of the bay sparkled with its countless gems like the breasts of a fair woman. The shores were purple and amethystine in the distance. Far out, bluish, phantom-like sails clustered against the pallid horizon. The dory danced like a feather over the ripples. They were close under the shadow of Chapel Point. Mary and Leslie waited in vain for her lover that afternoon. When he came at last in the odorous dusk of the June night, she met him on the acacia-shadowed veranda with cold sweetness. 
perhaps some subtle woman instinct whispered to her where and how he had spent the afternoon for she offered him no kiss nor did she ask him why he had failed to come sooner his eyes lingered on her in the dim light taking in every detail of her sweet womanly refinement and loveliness and with difficulty he choked back a groan again he asked himself what madness had come over him and again for an answer rose up the vision of magdalen crawford's face as he had seen it that day crimsoning beneath his gaze it was late when he left marian watched him out of sight standing under the acacias she shivered as with a sudden chill i feel as i think vashti must have felt she murmured aloud when discrowned and unqueened she crept out of the gates of shushan to hide her broken heart i wonder if esther has already usurped my scepter has that girl at the cove with her pale priest-like face and mysterious eyes stolen his heart from me perhaps not for it may never have been mine i know that esterbrook elliot will be true to the letter of his vows to me no matter what it may cost him but i want no pallid shadow of the love that belongs to another the hour of abdication is at hand i fear and what will be left for throneless vashti then Esterbrook Elliot, walking home through the mocking calm of the night, fought a hard battle with himself. He was face to face with the truth at last, the bitter knowledge that he had never loved Marian Leslie, save with a fond brotherly affection, and that he did love Magdalen Crawford with a passion that threatened to sweep before it every vestige of his honor and loyalty. He had seen her but three times, and his throbbing heart lay in the hollow of her cold white hand. He shut his eyes and groaned, What madness! what unutterable folly he was not free he was bound to another by every cord of honor and self-respect and even were he free magdalen crawford would be no fit wife for him in the eyes of the world at least a girl from the cove a girl with little education and no social standing ay but he loved her he groaned again and again in his misery Afar down the slope the bay waters lay like an inky strip and the distant murmurous plaint of the sea came out of the stillness of the night. The lights at the cove glimmered faintly. In the week that followed he went to the cove every day. Sometimes he did not see Magdalen. At other times he did. But at the end of the week he had conquered in the bitter, heart-crushing struggle with himself. If he had weakly given way to the first mad sweep of a new passion, the strength of his manhood reasserted itself at last faltering and wavering were over, though there was passionate pain in his voice when he said at last, I am not coming back again, Magdalen. They were standing in the shadow of the pine-fringed point that ran out to the left of the cove. They had been walking together along the shore, watching the splendor of the sea sunset that flamed and glowed in the west, where there was a sea of mackerel clouds, crimson and amber tinted, with long, ribbon-like strips of apple-green sky between. They had walked in silence, hand in hand, as children might have done, yet with the stir and throb of a mighty passion seething in their hearts. Magdalen turned as Esterbrook spoke and looked at him in a long silence. The bay stretched out before them, tranced and shimmering. A few stars shone down through the gloom of dusk. Right across the translucent greens and roses and blues of the west hung a dark, unsightly cloud, like the blurred outline of a monstrous bat. In the dim reflected light the girl's mournful face took on a weird, unearthly beauty. She turned her eyes from Esterbrook Elliot's set white face to the radiant gloom of the sea. "'That is best,' she answered at last, slowly. "'Best! Yes! Better that we had never met! I love you, you know it. Words are idle between us. I never loved before. I thought I did. I made a mistake, and I must pay the penalty of that mistake.' You understand me? I understand, she answered simply. I do not excuse myself. I have been weak and cowardly and disloyal, but I have conquered myself. I will be true to the woman to whom I am pledged. You and I must not meet again. I will crush this madness to death. I think I have been delirious ever since that day I saw you first, Magdalene. My brain is clearer now. I see my duty and I mean to do it at any cost. I dare not trust myself to say more. Magdalene, I have so much for which I ask your forgiveness. There is nothing to forgive, she said steadily. I have been as much to blame as you. 
if I had been as resolute as I ought to have been, if I had sent you away the second time as I did the first, this would not have come to pass. I have been weak, too, and I deserve to atone for my weakness by suffering. There is only one path open to us. Mr. Brooke, goodbye. Her voice quivered with an uncontrollable spasm of pain, but the misty, mournful eyes did not swerve from his. The man stepped forward and caught her in his arms. Magdalene, goodbye, my darling. Kiss me once, only once, before I go. She loosened his arms and stepped back proudly. No, no man kisses my lips unless he is my husband. Goodbye, dear. He bowed his head silently and went away looking back not once, else he might have seen her kneeling on the damp sand, weeping noiselessly and passionately. Mary Leslie looked at his pale, determined face the next evening and read it like an open book. She had grown paler herself. There were purple shadows under the sweet violet eyes that might have hinted of her own sleepless nights. She greeted him calmly, holding out a steady, white hand of welcome. She saw the traces of the struggle through which he had passed and knew that he had come off the victor. The knowledge made her task a little harder. It would have been easier to let slip the straining cable than to cast it from her when it lay unresistingly in her hand. For an instant, her heart thrilled with an unutterable sweet hope. Might he not forget in time? Need she snap in twain the weakened bond between them after all? Perhaps she might win back her lost scepter. Yet if— Womanly pride throttled the struggling hope. No divided allegiance, no hollow semblance of queenship for her. Her opportunity came when Esterbrook asked with grave earnestness if their marriage might not be hastened a little. Could he not have his bride in August? For a fleeting second Marion closed her eyes, and the slender hands lying among the laces in her lap clasped each other convulsively. Then she said quietly, Sometimes I have thought, Esterbrook, that it might be better— if we were never married at all. Esther Brooke turned a startled face upon her. Not married at all? Marion, what do you mean? Just what I say. I do not think we are as well suited to each other after all as we have fancied. We have loved each other as brother and sister might. That is all. I think it will be best to be brother and sister forever. Nothing more. Esther Brooke sprang to his feet. Marion, do you know what you were saying? You surely cannot have heard. No one could have told you. I have heard nothing. She interrupted hurriedly. No one has told me anything. I have only said what I have been thinking of late. I am sure we have made a mistake. It is not too late to remedy it. You will not refuse my request, Esterbrook. You will set me free? Good heavens, Marion, he said hoarsely. I cannot realize that you are in earnest. Have you ceased to care for me? The rigidly locked hands were clasped a little tighter. No. I shall always care for you as my friend, if you will let me. But I know we could not make each other happy. The time for that has gone by. I would never be satisfied, nor would you. Esterbrook, will you release me from a promise which has become an irksome fetter? He looked down on her upturned face mistily. A great joy was surging up in his heart yet it was mingled with great regret. He knew, none better, what was passing out of his life, what he was losing when he lost that pure womanly nature. "'If you really mean this, Marion,' he said slowly, "'if you really have come to feel that your truest love is not and never can be mine, that I cannot make you happy, then there is nothing for me to do but to grant your request. You are free.' "'Thank you, dear.' she said gently as she stood up. She slipped his ring from her finger and held it out to him. He took it mechanically. He still felt dazed and unreal. Marion held out her hand. Good night, Esther Brooke, she said a little wearily. I feel tired. I am glad you see it all in the same light as I do. Marion, he said earnestly, clasping the outstretched hand, are you sure that you will be happy? Are you sure that you are doing a wise thing? Quite sure she answered with a faint smile. I am not acting rashly. I have thought it all over carefully. Things are much better so, dear. We will always be friends. 
Your joys and your sorrows will be to me as my own. When another love comes to bless your life, Esther Brook, I will be glad. And now, good night. I want to be alone now. At the doorway, he turned to look back at her, standing in all her sweet stateliness in the twilight duskness, and the keen realization of all he had lost made him bow his head with a quick pang of regret. Then he went out into the darkness of the summer night. An hour later he stood alone on the little point where he had parted with Magdalene the night before. A restless night wind was moaning through the pines that fringed the bank behind him. The moon shone down radiantly, turning the calm expanse of the bay into a milk-white sheen. He took Marion's ring from his pocket and kissed it reverently. Then he threw it from him far out over the water. For a second the diamond flashed in the moonlight. Then, with a tiny splash, it fell among the ripples. Estherbrook turned his face to the cove, lying dark and silent in the curve between the crescent headlands, a solitary light glimmering from the low eaves of the Barrett cottage. Tomorrow, was his unspoken thought, I will be free to go back to Magdalen. End of A Strayed Allegiance 